be with you all. And, and with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, through our Lenten practice of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, we have followed Jesus to the beginning of this holiest of weeks. Let us pause to seek God's mercy and healing, that through this remembrance of the Lord's passion and death, we might be brought to the fullness of life. Lord Jesus, your passion and death were remedy for our sin. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Christ Jesus, your resurrection is our birth into new life. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the great king over all the earth. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on each of us. Forgive us our sins and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Savior to take flesh and submit to the cross, graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering and so merit a share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary a word that will rouse them. Morning after morning he opens my ear that I may hear and I have not rebelled, have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. My face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Thank mm -hmm. you. 
did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness. And found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Jesus and said, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time draws near. In your house I shall celebrate the Passover with my disciples. The disciples then did as Jesus had ordered and prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed at this, they began to say to him, one after another, Surely it is not I, Lord. He said in reply, He who has dipped his hand into the dish with me is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes as it has been written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, his betrayer, said in reply, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. He answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples, said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, 
and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, from now on I shall not drink this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you new in the kingdom of my Father. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, This night all of you will have your faith in me shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him in reply, Though all may have their faith in you shaken, mine will never be. Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples spoke likewise. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to feel sorrow and distress. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to his disciples, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, So you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing a second time, he prayed again. My father, if it is not possible that this cup pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open. He left them and withdrew again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand when the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who had come from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had arranged a sign with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him. Immediately he went over to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus answered him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then stepping forward, they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its sheath, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you not think that I cannot call upon my Father, and he will not provide me at this moment with more than twelve legions of angels? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must come to pass in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have I come out? Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to see me? Day after day I sat teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me. But all this has come to pass, that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. 
Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the high priest's courtyard, and going inside, he sat down with the servants to see the outcome. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward who stated, this man said, I can destroy the temple of God, and within three days rebuilt it. The high priest rose and addressed him. Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I order you to tell us under oath before the living God whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him in reply, You have said so, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? You have now heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? They said in reply, he deserves to die. Then they spat in his face and struck him, while some slapped him, saying, Prophesy for us, Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter, who was sitting outside in the courtyard, one of the maids came over to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. As he went out to the gate, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came over and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them. Even your speech gives you away. At that, he began to curse and to swear. I do not know the man. And immediately, a cock crowed. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to weep bitterly. When it was morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, deeply regretted what he had done. He returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? Look to it yourself. Flinging the money into the temple, he departed and went off and hanged himself. The chief priest gathered up the money but said, It is not lawful to deposit this in the temple treasury, for it is the price of blood. After consultation, they used it to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why that field, even today, is called the field of blood. Then was fulfilled what had been said through Jeremiah the prophet, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of a man with a price on his head, a price set by some of the Israelites, and they paid it out for the potter's field, just as the Lord had commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, who questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? But he did not answer him one word, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, 
the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had handed him over. While he was still seated on the bench, his wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. I suffered much in a dream today because of him. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, but to destroy Jesus. The governor said to them in reply, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They answered, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he was not succeeding at all, but that a riot was breaking out instead, he took water and washed his hands in the sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Look to it yourselves. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But after he had Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus inside the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped off his clothes and threw a scarlet military cloak about him. Weaving a crown out of thorns, they placed it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat upon him and took the reed and kept striking him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had him crucified, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and watched over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right, the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, if you are the Son of God, and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lamak sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, This one is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine, 
and putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The centurion and the men with him who were keeping watch over Jesus feared greatly when they saw the earthquake and all that was happening, and they said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. It was evening. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was himself a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be handed over. Taking the body, Jesus wrapped it in clean linen and laid it in his new tomb that he had hewn in the rock. Then he rolled a huge stone across the entrance to the tomb and departed. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary remained sitting there facing the tomb. The next day, the one following the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that this imposter, while still alive, said, After three days, I will be raised up. Give orders then that the grave be secured until the third day, lest his disciples come and steal him and say to the people, he has been risen from the dead. This last imposter would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, the guard is yours, go. Secure it as best you can. So they went and secured the tomb by fixing a seal to the stone and setting the guard. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father Ron Rollheiser centers his reflection for this Palm Sunday on the Lord's Passion on a particularly touching line that appears in all of the synoptic gospels of Jesus' death, which says that when he died, the veil of the sanctuary was torn from top to bottom. Like him, I can remember as a boy hearing that read in church and picturing that literally and thinking, now they'll know what a terrible thing that they've done. On the cross, we see one person, but as being held and empowered by somebody else. But that line doesn't refer to some ominous dark sign at the moment of crucifixion that's meant to stun the world and prove it, that it made a gross mistake. It refers to something else, not dark and fateful at all. The sanctuary veil was the curtain that hung between ordinary people and the Holy of Holies, the most sacred of all places, and prevented them from seeing what was behind. 
What the gospel writers are saying is that at the moment of Jesus' death, the veil that sits between us and the inner life of God is ripped open so that we can now see what God looks like inside. There's a similar type scene in The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy's dog Toto, you know, scampers and pulls the curtain back, revealing the true identity of the wizard. The cross for us, almost like a sword slashing through, a, through cloth, is the ultimate icon, the real depiction of the holy. It shows us God's heart, the inner life of the Trinity. Rollheiser goes on to explain how this is so. On the cross, there is not just one person, Jesus. Ultimately, all three persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, are on the cross. Now that's very different than the early church's heresy of patri-passionism. An unbiblical understanding of the relationship between the persons of the Trinity that in fact denies persons, plural, insisting only one person in the Godhead. It even crops up still today. In the popular novel in the movie The Shack, Mac accuses Papa, the father God figure who appears in the movie as a woman, of not caring about people's suffering. And in response, Papa pulls up her sleeves and shows Mac the nail prints on her wrists where she was crucified. The Father knows suffering because she, he, suffered along with the Son. That's patripassionism. On the surface, of course, you and I see Jesus, the Son. What's he doing? He's suffering and dying, but in a particular way. He hangs on the cross in anguish, dying, alone, humiliated, misunderstood, but he also hangs there in trust and in fidelity, giving his life away without resentment, without recrimination, and without bitter questioning because he knows and trusts someone deeply enough to literally believe in the sun even when it's not shining, in love even when it isn't showing itself, and somehow in God even when God appears to be silent. You and I see Jesus on the cross, but we see him clinging somehow to someone else with a trust that turns hatred into love, curses into blessings, bitterness into graciousness, recrimination into understanding, and God's silence into faith. On the cross, we see one person, but as being held and empowered by somebody else. Less visible, but clearly there as the recipient of this trust, present as the one about whom this drama is ultimately all about, is the Father. He is also on the cross, suffering with his Son holding the Son in this darkness, showing himself worthy of trust, and trusting the Son not to short-circuit the tension so that God's response, the resurrection, can be what it should be, not an act of vengeance, nor a bullying definition about who's really in charge, but an act of unfathomable redemption, unfathomable understanding forgiveness, and love. An act that more than anything else defines God. The Father is there too on the cross, suffering, waiting in patience, empowering another to trust. Finally, the Holy Spirit is also on the cross, uniquely generated and released by what unfolds there. As the drama of the crucifixion, this deep interplay of giving and receiving in love and trust is taking place, 
a forgiving warmth, a healing fire, and an unfathomable patience and understanding are being produced, revealed, and released. That energy, the ultimate oxygen, which the Gospels depict as spilling out of Jesus' pierced side as blood and water, is the Holy Spirit. And that spirit reveals precisely what's going on inside of God. So what's happening there? Inside of God, as we can see from the cross, there's no bitterness. There's no vengeance. There's no loss of patience or lack of graciousness. Not a single trace of it. When the veil inside the temple is torn, when the side of Jesus is pierced, what we see, what flows out, is only forgiveness, patience, gentleness, understanding, and a warm invitation. Rollheiser notes that we have an analogy for this, however inadequate, inside our own human relationships. Whenever we see two people who love each other so deeply, that the power of that love enables them to trust enough that they don't grow embittered, recriminating, and questioning of God in times of pain and darkness, which love somehow becomes an energy, a warm spirit, an oxygen that empowers everyone who comes into contact with it. Don't you and I see that in a good marriage? where the love and trust that a man and a woman have for each other becomes something akin to a warm fireplace that even warms everybody that's around them. From their side, too, flows blood and water, a spirit, a baptism. But that only happens when their love for each other is of the kind that enables them both to sweat blood in the garden rather than give in to bitterness, recrimination, the temptation to make God prove himself somehow. A good love empowers that both parties to carry the burdens of others as well as the burden of doubt, perhaps, without resentment. You see, the cross is an icon of that kind of love for us. As Christians, we love because the cross draws us toward love. Its power is as compelling as it is mysterious. The cross pulls us toward God, pulls us toward each other, a vast and very complicated kind of gathering place. Whether or not we want to see Jesus shamed and wounded, well, here he is drawing us closer and closer to a darkness where light ultimately dwells. It's the solid ground on which you and I have to stand, undecorated, stark, holy, brutal, and at the same time, beautiful. In the context of our current pandemic, it means trusting that God is in our very midst, in the midst of loss and terror, in the midst of mourning with and for us. It means accepting that we will die, if not now, then later, and trusting that we, like Jesus, will also rise again. It means speaking back to our own trembling hearts somehow, which so often prioritize self-protection over everything else that matters in this life. It means stepping back from those vicious cycles of denial and fear that seek to cheat death somehow, but in fact rob us of the abundant life that God truly wants to have and Jesus died to give us. I'll be honest, like many of you, I come to this Holy Week tired, uncertain, and just a little bit afraid. Who knows how many deaths lie waiting around the corner? 
How many sorrows and disappointments, farewells and jagged endings will we have to face before resurrection finally comes home to stay? I can't imagine most of it. But you see, God can. And that's the good news that Jesus preached. If anything in the Christian story is true, then this must be true as well. God loves us. Jesus died for us, and God will redeem us. God will not leave us alone. There is no death that we will die, however small or big, however literal or figurative, that Jesus and God does not hold in crucified arms. The cross for us is an icon. It defines God as love and gives us a picture of what kind of everlasting love looks like. Looks like even behind the curtain. Let us individually profess our faith as we join together in one voice. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. On the cross at Calvary, Jesus gave his life for the forgiveness of sins. Trusting in his compassion and love, let us turn and bring our needs before the Lord. For all who minister in the church, that they may be obedient to God's will, even to the point of death, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all judges, magistrates, and lawyers, that they may interpret the law with fairness and work to protect the gift of life in all forms, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the imprisoned, especially those on death row, and those who have received an unjust sentence, that they may rely upon God's compassion, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the elect of our church, those preparing for the waters of baptism, that they may spend their days, these days of preparation, in prayer and contemplation, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are ill, Jerry Corwin, Holly Smith, Gabriel Crow, particularly those with the COVID-19 virus, that God's healing spirit will ease their suffering and restore them to full health, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the human family, that God will deliver us from the COVID-19 virus, 
keep safe all who are vulnerable to the disease, and protect all healthcare workers who are serving those who are ill, we pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For all scientists and researchers, that God will guide and inspire their work as they seek to relieve the suffering of the sick and to develop new vaccines and treatments, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have been furloughed or become unemployed, that God will quickly end the virus, open new opportunities for them, and help them find the assistance which they need to sustain themselves and their families, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, Enrico Rose Yarbrough, Wilma Holyfield, Robert Louis Biafora, and particularly those who had the coronavirus, that they may live forever in the peace and joy of God's presence, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For our community of faith, that we may emulate the humility of Christ and proclaim God's love to the world in word and deed, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For those we have promised to remember in our prayer today, Monsignor John Schwader, Colleen Melisco, Father Edward Mitchell, James T. DeBaker, and the intentions of Carol Huff. For our Lenten prayer partners, for the intentions on the petition cross, and for those mentioned on the cup of thanksgiving, for those in the community prayer box in the hall, and for the members of St. Lucy's Parish family, and for their intentions, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Your servant, Lord our God, speaks the word that all the weary long to hear. Your son humbles himself to carry the cross that your people long to embrace. As we enter this holy week, let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. Empty us of ourselves, draw us close to his cross, that we may find in the obedience of Christ the strength to drink of the cup that did not pass him by. We ask this through your Son, the Christ, our Passover and our peace, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen.
sisters and brothers, pray that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and good of all His holy church. Through the passion of your only begotten Son, O Lord, may our reconciliation with you be near at hand, so that though we do not merit it by our own deeds, yet by this sacrifice made once for all, we may feel already the effects of your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your spirit. spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is right and just. and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For though innocent, he suffered willingly for sinners and accepted unjust condemnation to save the guilty. His death has washed away our sins, and his resurrection has purchased our justification. And so, with all the angels, we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and, once more giving thanks, he gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, 
Alan Vigneron, the Archbishop of our diocese, and those who assist him, with bishops throughout the world, the clergy, and all who care for your people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles and you say to each of us, my peace I leave with you, my peace is my gift to you. Lord, look not on our sins, but look on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with, and with your spirit. spirit. Thank you. Let's offer each other some sign of that peace of Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I'm not, not worthy that you should enter under my roof. roof. But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
It has long been a Catholic understanding that when circumstances prevent one from receiving Holy Communion, it is possible to make an act of spiritual communion, which is a source of grace. Spiritual communion means uniting oneself in prayer with Christ's sacrifice and worshiping him in his body and blood. The most common reason for making an act of spiritual communion is when a person cannot attend Mass. Acts of spiritual communion increase our desire to receive sacramental communion and help us avoid the sins that would make us unable to receive Holy Communion worthily. A prayer for spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you in my soul. Since I cannot, at this moment, receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Nourished with these sacred gifts, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that just as through the death of your Son you have brought us to hope for what we believe, so by his resurrection you may lead us to where you call, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Continue in keeping with Governor Whitmer's stay home, stay safe executive order. The parish offices, of course, are closed through Monday, April the 13th. The church building will also be remain closed during this same time. The pastoral leadership team are certainly checking their phone messages and emails throughout the day, every day, and responding to emergency needs as quickly as possible. If you should have any need at all, please don't hesitate to call the parish's main number, 586-771-8300 and certainly leave a message and your call will be returned as soon as possible. The Surf Vicariate Penance Services scheduled for this Holy Week have been canceled. Those in dire need of this sacrament are asked to call the parish office and together we will determine how to take and the necessary precautions for your individual welfare as well as my own and at the same time protect the sacramental seal. It is not permissible at any time for sacramental confession to take place via the telephone or via internet. Tuesday evening is our sixth annual opportunity to unplug and to join in an hour of prayer together as an entire parish family. In addition to those who will gather at home, others have expressed an interest in gathering in their cars in the St. Lucie parking lot. No one is obligated to come since the stay home, stay safe executive order is still in place. No one should be put at risk. Everyone who does gather at St. Lucie's must come by car and must remain in their automobile at all times. We simply can't have walk-ups or others milling around. There can be no visiting between cars. Windows cannot be fully lowered. Ideally, engines should be turned off and consider bringing a blanket if the evening does get a little chilly. 
Cars should be parked with their headlights facing the church and ideally positioned in such a way so as to honor, respect, and keep social distancing primary for any who do attend. Any behavior in the parking lot outside of these guidelines are going to force a conclusion to our time of prayer immediately and will result in a violation of the governor's executive order. We've been told by herself that fines may result. Holy Week, of course, is going to be very different this year. All are invited to view the Chrism Mass on Monday evening as it's live streamed from the cathedral at 7 o'clock in the evening. Our St. Lucie celebrations on Holy Thursday and Good Friday will be broadcast on Thursday evening and late Friday afternoon. We expect to broadcast the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday evening. On Easter Sunday, we're encouraging all our parish families to join in prayer and to view Archbishop Vigneron's Easter Sunday Mass broadcast from the cathedral, gathering at home throughout the entire archdiocese in prayer together. The time of that broadcast is 11 a.m. Easter Sunday morning. As part of this Easter as the church is deployed away from the building this year, we're also asking if every parish household might take a selfie or a photo holding some kind of Easter greeting to everyone. Send them to us as soon as possible this week and we'll put together a giant Easter card video for all to see. Thank you to so many of you who have offered your prayerful support and your continued financial stewardship of our mission and ministry during these challenging days. The food pantry remains open for emergencies by appointment only. We truly appreciate your pantry and your parish donations, whether they are by mail, online giving, or dropping them off inside the front doors of the church. Our light continues to shine across the shadow of these most difficult days. Remember to stay safe and, of course, check with your doctor immediately if you are experiencing any kind of health distress during this time. And finally, a prayer of solidarity as we begin this Holy Week together. For all who have contracted coronavirus, we pray for care and healing. For those who are particularly vulnerable, we pray for safety and protection. For all who experience fear or anxiety, we pray for peace of mind and spirit. For affected families who are facing difficult decisions between food on the table or public safety, we pray for policies that recognize their plight. For those who do not have adequate health insurance, we pray that no family will face financial burdens alone. For those who are afraid to access care due to immigration status, we pray for recognition of the God-given dignity of all. For our brothers and sisters around the world, we pray for shared solidarity. For public officials and decision makers, we pray for wisdom and guidance. Father, during this time, may your, may your church and children be a sign of hope comfort and love to all. Grant peace, grant comfort, grant healing. Be with us, Lord. The Lord be with you. And with, and with your spirit. spirit. Please bow your heads. We'll pray now for God's blessing. Look, we pray, O Lord, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ did not hesitate to be delivered into the hands of the wicked and submit to the agony of the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks, Thanks to you, God. God.